G'day, I'm Gary Stevens, and welcome to the third season of the History in the Bible podcast. In this final season, I explore how the Jews and the Christians constructed new religions when they were sent spinning into the void after the destruction of the temple. All of the history about all of the books beyond the Bible. Episode 3.27, The Last Heirs of Abraham, Part 1. In my final episodes, I want to follow the history of the heirs of Abraham through to the year 200. By that year, Abraham's heirs had been winnowed by three Roman wars. Only two remained, the Judaism of the rabbis and the imperial church in corporate. In this episode, I need to set the stage. And to do that, I have to return to the very beginning. I should warn you I have a lot of callbacks in this episode, just to remind you what you missed. Please bear with me. The book of Genesis tells the story of the origin of the Hebrews. The saga starts with Abraham, the first Jew. God made Abraham his favourite, and gave him the land of Canaan for his own. Abraham had many offspring. Genesis paints a plausible picture that these earliest Hebrews worshipped at local improvised shrines. The book goes on to describe Abraham's descendants moving to Egypt. This is wholly credible. Archaeology shows us that there was constant intercourse between the Levant and Egypt. The book of Exodus holds the Hebrews were kept captive in Egypt for many generations. After God returned from his extended tea break of four centuries, he appointed Moses and his brother Aaron to lead the Hebrews back to Canaan. Later Jewish commentators strained to connect the name of Moses to the uncommon Hebrew word Moshur, to draw out of, say, water. These days, scholars link it to a root found in the classic Egyptian names Thutmose, Ramesses, and Amos. A root that could be either be son or gave birth, as in Ramesses, the god Ra gave birth, or son of Ra. For theological reasons, a journey that should have taken a few weeks was stretched to 40 years. To hear more about that great story, check out episode 1.14, Exodus 2, Leaving Egypt. According to Exodus, Moses was the first to know God's personal name and the first to receive the details of the contract that would bind God, the people and the land. According to much later Jewish thought, the fine print of this covenant was entrusted to Moses' rabbis. For unclear reasons, they decided to pass down the fine print orally, rather than write it down. Moses led his people to the borders of the Promised Land. God forbade him to enter it. That task was left to his successor, Joshua. According to the book named after him, Joshua led a vicious war against the Canaanites, resulting in complete victory for the Hebrews. Modern scholarship has nothing to say of where the patriarchs and Moses and Joshua can be located in the archaeological record. Nothing really works. Somewhere in the Bronze Age. And maybe Joshua can be located just after the Bronze Age collapse. The evidence is that the ancient Hebrews were Canaanites from the hill country, alongside the River Jordan. This rough country became a refuge for Canaanites fleeing their burning coastal cities during the Bronze Age collapse. For more on that, rewind to episode 1.6, Canaan of the Patriarchs. But surely the ancient Hebrews were not just highland Canaanites. No, they were not. One synthesis of the evidence argues that the collection of Canaanite tribes that would later become the Israelites did include an outside group, that emigrated from Egypt at some unknown time in the late Bronze Age. 
it was the incorporation of this community that transformed some of the highland Canaanites into the Israelites. The emigres brought with them stories of the great storm god Yahweh, stories they had picked up on their travels through the lands south of Canaan. Midian, bordering Arabia and the Red Sea. The Tanakh, Old Testament, tells us that Moses spent decades in Midian and married the daughter of a Midianite priest. The emigres eventually became the priestly tribe of Levi, fierce defenders of the faith of Moses. Their god Yahweh merged with and eventually supplanted the native Canaanite god of El. Now, I go into more detail about that in episode 1.28. Modern Debates, Judging Joshua and the Judges. The squabbling tribes depicted in the book of Judges eventually fought their way into the early Iron Age. They celebrated by installing a monarchy, at first under Saul and then under David. That didn't work out so well. Upon the death of David's son Solomon, the small kingdom split into two even tinier kingdoms. To the north was Israel, a prosperous and populous urbane society. Many dynasties would rule in Israel. To the south was Judah and its capital of Jerusalem. Well, to put it plainly, Judah was a dump. Perhaps because no one else wanted it. The house of David ruled the land until its destruction. You can catch up on the fascinating and complex story of the two kingdoms with the last episodes of season one. From episode 1.42, The Kingdom Sundered. The vibrant little kingdom of Israel was eventually crushed by Assyria. Refugees fled south to Judah. With a new population of Hebrew-speaking cousins running all over the place, some of the Judean kings thought they should lay down the rules to these new immigrants. Rule 1. Your rightful king is a descendant of the great David. And we all know David was chosen by God, right? Don't even think about changing that. Rule 2. The priests of the temple in Jerusalem run your religion now. No more little rural shrines and rustic priests. A century after Israel was smashed by Assyria, Judah fell to Babylon. Its inhabitants were deported. The survivors were taken to cosmopolitan Mesopotamia. As we know from recently excavated tablets, the exiles prospered, learnt letters, and began to put their stories down on papyrus. Fifty years after the Great Deportation, Persia conquered Babylon in an almost comical way. For more on the oddball last ruler of Babylon, tune into episode 2.4, Leaving Babylon Part 2, Cyrus and the Mystery of Sheshbazar. The new Persian overlords of Mesopotamia freed the exiles. Go home, they said. The Judeans were loath to leave a fertile and cosmopolitan country. You could catch a musical revival and buy a falafel dinner any time you liked. Canaan had none of those attractions. After many fitful starts, some of the Judean refugees returned to the Promised Land. There they created a new temple to replace the one that Solomon had built and that the Babylonians had destroyed. And so we enter the Second Temple period. The returnees brought back not only themselves and their goodies, but a new theology. And for more on that, rewind to episode 2.3, Leaving Babylon Part 1, the Ezra Muddle. During this period, the priest scribe Ezra reconstructed Judaism. The prophets were long since silent. The last scions of the holy Davidic monarchy had vanished in Babylon. From now on there was only the Torah, the law. Ezra said that neither kings nor prophets were the sources of authority. Only the law was. All the old traditions of the divinely appointed monarch and the centrality of the covenant were submerged in the concept of the law. The law was God's special gift to the Jews. 
the custodians of the law were the high priests. They became the pivot of all political struggles. From Persian times onwards, the office of high priest was the kingly chess piece contested by the Jewish upper classes and Jewish factions. Monotheism finally triumphed. We have an abundance of archaeological evidence for polytheistic practices amongst the Hebrews before the exile. Judah is littered with votive statues to Astarte, God's wife. There is almost no evidence for polytheism after the return. By the time the Jews had decided there was but one God for all the world, they also decided he was completely unlike all those fake gods their neighbours worshipped. Utterly transcendent. Utterly beyond the experience of humankind. God could not be depicted as a statue or some sort of icon. Even his very name could not be spoken. The Judeans spent a blissful two centuries under benign Persian patronage. And for more on that, harken back to episode 2.7, Under Persia, Farewell to the Old Testament. They established laws and government under the high priest of the temple, a perfect theocracy indolently overseen by a distant and indifferent Persian satrap. The happy and harmonious administration of the Persians was rudely ruptured by the invasion of Alexander the Great. Although Alexander himself would not long rule, his Macedonian successors would. For centuries. As it had been during the ancient Assyrian and Egyptian rivalries, Judah was ping-ponged between two great powers, one to the south and one to the north. The Jews' first Hellenistic rulers were the Ptolemies of Egypt. Successive waves of immigrants from Judea to Egypt show that the reign of the Ptolemies was liberal and inviting. The many Judeans in Egypt embraced the Greek tongue. Just two generations after Alexander had brought the Greek language to Egypt, most Alexandrian Judeans had lost a working knowledge of Hebrew. They could not understand their own scriptures. The story goes that one Ptolemaic king had the Tanakh translated into Greek for their benefit. The Judeans spent a more or less relaxing 130 years under the tutelage of the Ptolemies. Their repose was impolitely interrupted by the Greek Seleucids who dominated everything from Syria to Babylonia. The Seleucids claimed Judea as their own. They brought a very different style of rule. Where the Ptolemies had left the Judeans to their own devices, the Seleucids demanded Greek governors. Where the Ptolemies ruled with a light touch, the Seleucids were heavy-handed. The Judeans eventually revolted against their boorish masters and briefly achieved an independent native state under the Maccabees. The Maccabean rulers soon became Hellenized. Their last rulers were squabbling in confidence. <laughs> Look, for more on those nitwits, check out episode 2.15, The Rise and Ruin of the Maccabeans. During Hellenistic and Maccabean times, the Judeans established communities throughout the eastern Mediterranean as far afield as Rome and Cyrenaica, modern Libya. They were especially populous in Egypt and the island of Cyprus. In his missionary work, Paul encountered many Judean communities in Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey, and Greece. Dispersed as these communities were, most regarded the temple as the great axis of their world. Male Judeans everywhere paid an annual tie to the temple. Nice work if you can get it. Judean men were supposed to attend the temple three times a year at the great festivals. Still, quite a few of the factions thought the temple was an axis of evil. Although obliged to acknowledge its power and symbolic force, many sects held the fat cat establishment in contempt. By Maccabean times, the Old Testament, or Tanakh, was reaching its final form. Two mighty rivers percolated through the Jewish religious landscape of the Second Temple period. The first, most obvious and most assertive, 
is that championed by the priestly successors to Moses' brother Aaron. It surfaces in many places, in the five books of Moses, and runs through the books of Ezekiel, and then the later historical books, such as Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. The priestly tradition is preoccupied with defining cosmic order and earthly social structures. It creates a hierarchy of the good, at the pinnacle god, then the priests, then the Levites, followed by male Jews, then female Jews, and finally Gentiles. The tradition defines and enforces boundaries between the holy people and outsiders. Violating these boundaries can lead to disastrous consequences. In the end, God will forgive these violations and make all right. Alongside this mighty current runs a tradition of wisdom literature. Mesopotamian and Egyptian wisdom literature is amongst the most ancient in the world. These cultures passed down many books, filled with the sayings of the sages, fables, homilies, and exhortations to do right before the gods. The Israelites constructed their own versions, the Book of Proverbs, Jonah, Job, and Ecclesiastes. These were lay creations. They have no truck with the priestly establishment with all its fussy laws. And they are not interested in God's covenants with Abraham and Moses. A recent development in biblical scholarship is the recognition that there was a distinct third tradition in Second Temple Jewish intellectual life. This was based on the figure of the patriarch Enoch. He was father to Methuselah, and great-grandfather to Noah. Now, you might recall the movie Noah, with Russell Crowe as the man, and Anthony Hopkins in an extended cameo as Methuselah. The filmmakers merged the character of Methuselah with his father Enoch. A wise decision. Most moviegoers have heard of Methuselah. Few have the faintest idea about Enoch. Why Enoch? Enoch was special. Super special. Only two people in the entire Old Testament were taken by God before they died, Enoch and Elijah. How special can you get? Venerable traditions around Elijah are an important part of modern Judaism. Those around Enoch have disappeared. The earliest document we have from this tradition is the first third of the book we call First Enoch. Best guess is that this was written in late Hellenistic times. Call it maybe 250 to 150 BCE. You can find all the goss on that in episode 2.9, The Apocalypse to End Them All, First Enoch. In their day, the Enochites produced an astonishing range of books. This was a great Jewish intellectual renaissance books of odes and songs and psalms and testaments. The Dead Sea Scrolls reveal to us how popular these books were. These books abandoned the historical narrative of the books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles. They abandoned prophecy. With the Judeans safely in charge of Jerusalem and the Temple, the prophetic voice became redundant and the historical voice unnecessary. The story had ended just as the prophets said it would, with God in charge of Jerusalem. Writers were now free to turn to new forms of expression. The temple elites had the self-assurance to let them do so. That freedom allowed some very Rococo forms to blossom. Where does this literature come from? One idea is that some faction of the priestly establishment in Hellenistic times came to believe they had been denied their just and rightful place in the temple hierarchy. Their exclusion could only mean that the priestly concept of a just and ordered universe was mistaken. Rather, a rebellion had broken out in heaven, leaving the wicked and corrupt in charge. As the intercessor between God and humanity, Enoch had established a truly pure priesthood. This had been corrupted by the sons of Aaron, who were actually evil usurpers. The Enochite works took their lead from the prophet Zechariah, who predicts a new heaven and a new earth. Quote, 
Zechariah 14.1 Lo, a day of Yahweh is coming, when your spoil shall be divided in your very midst. For I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem for war. Then Yahweh will come forth and make war on those nations. In that day there shall be neither sunlight nor cold moonlight. And Yahweh shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord with one name. As for those people that warred against Jerusalem, Yahweh will smite them with this plague. In that day a great panic from Yahweh shall fall upon them, and everyone shall snatch at the hand of another, and everyone shall raise his hand against everyone else's hand. End quote. For more about Zechariah, you could always spend a few minutes with my episode 2.5, Leaving Babylon Part 3, The Enigma of Zerubbabel and Joshua. These hints from the prophets found full bloom in the Enochite books. The end of times, the apocalypse, was coming. The apocalyptic books gave the Judeans hope and strength. The books taught that their oppression in the world was just a shadow of heavenly realities. Everything that happened on earth was just a mirror image of vastly greater battles happening on a cosmic scale. Struggles that humans could barely hope to comprehend. The Enochite books present a wholly new elaborate cosmology, with a hierarchy of divine beings. It rewrites the book of Genesis. It explains why there is evil. The Tanakh had always struggled with that question. Evil came with fallen angels. Now, this literature has nothing to say about the law, and it also speaks at length of a life after death and the concept of a hell. All these were novelties. The works also reject the second temple as impure in a striking rejection of the entire priestly establishment. The books said that the oppressed could resist until God intervened in history with his angels and divine armies, alongside which the righteous would fight. The worldly powers might seem powerful now, but they were puny compared to the vast heavenly forces that would one day be unleashed upon them. The Enochite writings of the Second Temple period would have been unrecognisable to Abraham and Moses and David. The Old Testament God was just. The Enochite God was vengeful. Their God had long ago lost interest in conversing with his chosen people. He evaporated into a philosophical haze. As God turned into some sort of a numinous platonic ideal, his activity in the world was delegated to angels. Now, moving in the opposite direction, Satan became more personified and descended to earth. The Old Testament was adamant that Satan was a divine functionary. He was God's faithful employee and prosecuting attorney. The writings of the late Second Temple period transformed Satan into the fount of all evil and gave him an army of demons and fallen angels. And of course, the Enochites also invented the afterlife. In the Old Testament, the blessings and cursings attached to the divine contract were realised in this world, not the next. For there was no next world. The contract was not between God and individual Jews, but the people as a whole. The Enochite authors contemplated the idea of a life after death and a personal resurrection from the dead. While the final Maccabees, last native rulers of Judea, were bickering and attacking each other, the Romans marched down the coast. They were delighted to receive embassies from the Jewish people, begging the imperial power to save them from the Maccabean idiots. The Romans obliged and installed Herod the Great. The concordat with Herod's dynasty brought peace and stability for a century. For that hundred years, Rome was no enemy to the Judeans, but a friend. The Judean bodies politic and religious were rent into sects. Essenes, Zealots, Sadducees, Boethusians, Sicarii and Pharisees, and certainly others whose names have not passed down to us. 
Their religious differences rarely led to discord. But their political animosities would have fatal consequences. The popularity of the Enochite books reached its height in the Roman period. The Jews were discombobulated. Their scriptures and later prophets told them that the king of Jerusalem and Jerusalem's God would govern the whole world. The prophet Isaiah was confident that the nations of earth would accept Yahweh and bow down to him in Jerusalem. The Jews were meant to be a light unto the nations, an imperial power. It was clear to all Jews after the arrival of the Romans that their social and political situation was the exact opposite to the pretensions of the scriptures and prophets. Their province was a desert backwater. What was to be done? The scenery has been placed, the actors are waiting in the wings. The stage is now set for the tragic winnowing of the heirs of Abraham. See you next time. Thanks for visiting. For show notes, maps, charts and timelines, visit my website at www.historyinthebible.com You can even download professional posters for free.